on the phone. It's a pleasure to welcome to the program Ken Vogel, a writer for Politico and author of Big Money on the Trail of the Ultra-Rich Hijacking American Politics. We will link to that at uh, Majority.fm. Welcome to the program, Ken. It's great to be with you, Sam. Uh, so now, Ken, um, this uh, I, I enjoyed this piece uh, uh, quite a bit because I'm I'm quite convinced that this uh, this whole this the sort of corner of uh, politics that you you've covered here in this uh, in the rise of scam packs is really sort of metaphorical for a larger <laughs> dynamic in our politics. But let's let's start here and work out from this. Um, what what do you mean by scam packs? Well, these are PACs that are uh, raising money, and they're largely on the right from grassroots activists in small sums, $25, $50, $75, uh, purporting to take on the GOP establishment or take on Democrats, usually playing to whatever the hot issue of the day is, a hot scandal on the right, Benghazi, Obamacare, Fast and Furious, Al Sharpton, whatever, uh, and what we found is when we look back through their Federal Election Commission filings, they're raising a lot of money, but they're actually not spending very much at all on those causes that they purport to be supporting or opposing. Rather, the money is going directly into huge consulting fees, including to uh, firms or consultants who are directly involved in running the PAC. So it's quite a bit of self-dealing. There's a, there seems to be a lot of self-dealing, and, and let's go through this. And one of the, the PACs, uh, the one that uh, y- you start with, help us stop Jeb Bush today, is actually uh, the chairman is actually Sean McCutcheon, whose name may sound familiar to people. Um, tell us about uh, McCutcheon's uh, pack, or I guess he's got he, he's involved with multiple ones. Yeah, so uh, Sean McCutcheon, actually, this is sort of how we got uh, into politics, was he was looking for a way to play at the national level. He had been sort of a mid-tier donor at the, uh, at the state level in Alabama, where he's from, where he owns a business. And uh, so he hired this guy, Dan Backer. He's a lawyer who uh, is sort of uh, part gadfly, part compliance guy, and, uh, you know, part, frankly, scam pack operator. So uh, McCutcheon hooked up with him, and this guy was uh, pushing him. So this guy, Dan Backer, set up a pack for him, started raising money, sort of doing some of the same stuff same stuff that we're talking about up to and including their recent, uh, most recent effort to uh, knock Jeb Bush out of the race, however they uh, say that they're going to do that. But uh, this guy, Dan Backer, was also encouraging him, hey, you know, you should file lawsuits against these various uh, federal election rules that Backer and some conservatives believe are sort of infringements on free speech. McCutcheon did that. One of these cases went all the way up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court found in his favor that it was unconstitutional to cap, uh, to, to have an aggregate cap on how many small capped donations you could give to political action committees, party committees, candidates. So this indirectly helps the scam pack operator, Dan Backer, to raise more money for these scam packs, including one, uh, ones that Sean McCutcheon has involved in. So it's kind of a full circle of uh, scamminess there. And we should say, though, I mean, the McCutcheon is going to be is a boon also for uh, the the establishment party apparatus of both parties. Right. I mean, uh, without an aggregate limit, the, the, there's the, all bets are off at this point. Yeah, that's right. But the, the case greatly expanded uh, what the party is able to what the parties are able to raise. And, and that is since subsequently been expanded still further by a writer that was inserted on the omnibus bill late last year, the Cromdebus, if you will, uh, that allows the party to raise even bigger sums for these specific pools to, you know, boost the party's headquarters and to pay for recounts and stuff like this. So it actually inadvertently sort of helps the parties in their effort to put down these scam packs. The parties are, are quite nervous about these scam packs. They think that siphoning off small donations that would be hugely impactful and helpful to them in helping their candidates, uh, particularly the presidential candidates, during this period between the, the, uh, the primary election and the general election. Uh, they think that these scam packs are making it more difficult for them to tap into that small dollar donor flow that sort of continues to come throughout the election. Uh, so 
they want they they want to raise as much money as possible, and and the McCutcheon decision allows them to do that, and may end up hurting the ability of these scam packs to raise a, a lot of money from unsuspecting donors. Let's I mean let's put this in context. Well, uh, before we get there, because you know the. Uh, this the the nar- well uh, there's some things that I am sort of skeptical about that that we'll get to but before we get there let's let's continue through this at one point uh, you talked to Eric Erickson about um, and he has been and I think if you anybody follows him on Twitter or occasionally heads over to uh, to to Red State you can see that he uh, he calls out some of these people now in my mind I can't help but think like. He's just basically, this is just a competition, right? I mean, uh, but uh, before we go in, disabuse me of that notion. In other words, is this just Eric Erickson's really saying, like, there are some people out there without integrity, or is it really just Eric Erickson saying, like, hey, uh, I got Coke, they got Pepsi, I I want you to buy Coke? Well, yeah, that's part of the problem with with these packs is that there is no... Uh, first of all, there are no like legal guidelines as to how much a PAC needs to spend on programmatic costs, that is, contributions to candidates or uh, advertising costs or field work. You know, the things that they say that they're actually raising money for. So there is no definition as to what is a good PAC and what is a bad PAC. So it leads to these fights between various factions on the right, you know, both purporting to support the Tea Party, uh, sort of internecine Tea Party warfare, and then also between the parties and the sort of establishment blessed PACs and these, these PACs that are sort of more Tea Party fringe PACs, everyone is sort of pointing fingers at everyone else saying, no, you're illegitimate, you're putting money in your consultant's pockets, no, you're illegitimate, uh, and there's no one to sort of come in, there's no better business bureau for PACs to say, okay, this is what is, this is, these are the practices of a good PAC, these are the practices of a bad PAC, these are good PACs, these are bad PACs. So, Eric Erickson, you're right, he does point the finger at a lot of these folks, and a lot of these folks point the finger right back at him and say, wait a minute, you're making your list available for rent, including to us, uh, you are supporting other political action committees that we think have sort of problems in their uh, FEC reports. So uh, it's kind of a mess. There's a lot of confusion, and that's the environment that has allowed these PACs to really uh, take off and find fertile turf. Yeah, at one point, I mean, uh, just to, to be clear to people, you know, this is the uh, – these PACs – well, how do these PACs, when they get their email – okay, so I start a PAC, and I decide, like, okay, I'm going to pay myself um, – Three hundred thousand dollars a year to uh, to manage this pack and as a consultant and whatnot, and so I need to start raising money. I need to get an email list, right? Because how else do I reach people unless I uh, unless I, I guess I have already some other platform? I could have a radio show. I could have a, a, a widely disseminated podcast. I'm actually just trying to figure this out myself. Uh, but uh, wh- wh- if I don't have that email list, where do I go? What do I do? Yeah, I, I mean, you need money to raise money. And this is sort of like a hard truth of politics that whether you're the RNC or Carl Rose American Crossroads or ready for Hillary, you need to have money in order to reach out to people and target people to give, you know, who, who are going to be your sort of target demographic. And the way that you do that is you rent these lists from brokers who uh, call from various sources email list, uh, phone phone number list, address list, depending on whether you're doing direct mail, phone banking, or uh, or email solicitations. And, you know, there are there are brokers who will, can get you Hillary Clinton's campaign list if you're ready for Hillary. They can rent Hillary Clinton's 2008 campaign list. If you're a Tea Party pack, they can rent Ted Cruz's list, or they can rent Eric Erickson's list. So that's sort of where you get into this. Uh, back and forth finger pointing, where uh, you know the folks who are renting Eric, Eric Eric Erickson's list, who are being accused by Eric Erickson of being scammers, are saying, "Hey, you're involved in this ecosystem as well." So that's just in, in sort of a very oversimplified explanation as to how you would come into uh, possession of these emails, and you wouldn't even really own them. What you would do is you would rent them, and the list broker would sort of send out the email to this wide list, and then anyone who responded back to you, you would own their email list, and then you sort of start assembling your own email list that you could rent to others. Uh, It's a giant circle, profitable business, and one that has very little regulation. And I'm wondering why I'm not involved in it in some way. And, uh, but but uh, 
but there was one point in the uh, piece where um, where Eric Erickson said, like, God, yeah, no, I hate it. I mean, because his, I, I'm on his email list, and every third email is, uh, you know, I get a, a digest from him in the morning and then something else, and then it's, uh, you know, some combination of freeze-dried food, freeze-dried gold, freeze-dried, um, I don't know, uh, you know, male enhancement uh, formulas, and then obviously some of these packs as well, you know, stop Bush, stop Pelosi, stop, uh, you know, help uh, Alan West. I, he, Eric Erickson claims he doesn't have control over his, his email list. What, now, how, how does that work? He gives it to a broker and then has no say whatsoever? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's sort of, that seems to be what he is claiming. But you could see how very quickly you would sort of lose control, even if at one point you had control. I mean, the goal is, like for Ready for Hillary, for example, the goal was essentially to own the Clinton email list. So they would rent it. They would send out emails to, to everyone and then get, you know, whether they're inactive responses and wipe them off the, their own list or – Get uh, get actual uh, contributions that then you would own the email list. So then you are essentially emailing to uh, the Clinton email list from a new entity, and that is the goal of this. The goal of uh, of uh, sort of uh, the, the email list game is to be able to get as high a rate of return on each message that you send out, so that you essentially are possessing the emails, and then they are yours. And then you can rent them to other people, and other people are doing the same thing. So you see how, like, just a few right. generations off of that, it can get pretty both diluted and pretty far afield from whatever the original message or mission of the folks who originally got those email lists was. Right, indeed. And and now, give me a sense. I mean, you're obviously, um, you know, you've written a book on uh, on big money. You you're you're in the trenches reporting on this stuff on a daily basis. How much faith do you put in to Eric Erickson's claim that he couldn't? Uh, it may be the case that look, you know, they've rented out in the in the past, and other people have built off those lists. But it seems to me, I mean, I you know, I deal with an ad broker for this show. I can say I'm not going to take that ad. And at one point, the ad broker says, "Well, then I'm not going to work with you anymore." So this isn't. It's not exactly like he's powerless here, right? I mean, that that I just that just stuck out at me, like. Oh, what? He's one of the only people in the world who don't have control over his own property. That must really irk some people in this conservative outfit. Yeah, I don't know, like, how much autonomy he has. I think it probably differs on a case-by-case -case basis. But, you know, certainly, like, uh, you, he's not, he doesn't own Red State. You know, he's the editor of Red State. So Red State would own property, and, and then Salem Communications owns Red State. So you could uh. see how it could pretty quickly be out of his hand. Uh, that's not to say that I, it, it is that I'm, uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of absolving him of any responsibility in this. But, uh, you know, I don't know the situation different case to case, and you could easily see there being the potential for someone who is merely an employee, however big of a personality they are, of a media company to not have possession of, of emails that are sort of being sent out under their name or under their banner. Right. All right, so give us a sense, like, when we talk about this dynamic, we see this in charities, right? Uh, X number of dollars go towards administrative costs, uh, y number of dollars go towards actually helping those that the charity ostensibly is set up to help. Do, do you have a sense of, like, what the average is? I mean, there, there, you know, there was a couple of, of references to some of these. So give us a sense of, like, when you're looking at this and determining, okay, who falls into what category, give us a sense of the, that, that, that proportion that you're looking at, like, give us an example of of one that has a high proportion that actually goes to candidates versus administrative, and vice versa. Yeah, sure. So, American Crossroads, the Carl Rove Super PAC, which uh, you know, there's plenty of valid critiques to be made of it, including from the right. But they certainly do spend an overwhelming proportion of their money on what they say that they're going to spend it on, which is you know, essentially big money advertisements attacking Democrats. So, during the 2014 cycle. Uh, they raised $31.3 million, and they spent about 70% of that on ads and donations to candidates. That's on the high end. In fact, it's easier, and this is why it's very difficult to uh, <laughs> sort of generalize about this, because, in fact, they have, they have sort of the, uh, the, the 
the easiest path to uh, striking, uh, to, to, to achieving like a high percentage spend on programmatic costs because they're raising from big donors, uh, so they're not spending a lot of money on fundraising. I mean, it's, it costs far less for Carl Rowe to fly out to uh, Las Vegas and meet with Sheldon Adelson and solicit a $10 million check than it costs to raise $10 million from small donors. Uh, and in addition, the, the advertisements are sort of the, um, you know, the, the, that is the sort of easiest way to show that you are spending a lot of money on, on candidates and on campaigns, even if there is some, I think, very valid criticism of sort of the limitations of big money advertising as a way to try to shape an election. Many people say on the right that conservatives, including Rove, would be better served to be spent, would better serve the cause to be spending more of that money on get out the vote efforts, on uh, canvassing, even on direct mail. Uh, and that type of stuff is more expensive, and it's more difficult to show because so much of that does go to consultants. It's more difficult to show that you're spending that money directly in service of the cause that you say that you're going to be supporting. Uh, so in many ways, Rogue sort of has a, a, the, the, uh, the, you know, the perfect storm uh, of the ability to show a high percentage being spent on programmatic costs, whereas another group that I uh, uh, talked to, this Madison Project, which is a group that is supported by Eric Erickson, more Tea Party-oriented group that spends a greater percentage of their cash on get out the vote on ground game. They went into some of these Senate primaries, lost most of them, but like Matt Devin uh, against Mitch McConnell, uh, Tad Cochran's uh, lost or uh, win over uh, Chris McDaniel. They went in on behalf of McDaniel. Uh, so they spent about $950,000 of, uh, of the total $5.2 million that they raised on ads, campaign contributions, and get out the vote efforts. Well, that was mostly get out the vote efforts. So, you know, even there, it's very difficult for me making the analysis from the outside to say, okay, this is a programmatic cost and this is in your pocket, you know? Right. Uh, so and even then, I. Get its limitations. And even then, I would imagine it's also a difficult calculation because. Uh, you got a 70% rate for Rove, but he's still, there's $8 million that are going into people's pockets. Whereas, you know, you're talking about uh, Eric Erickson's, okay, there's $4 million going into people's pockets. It may just be, I mean, this is, I guess, the, 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 the dilemma. It may just be that it's also, you need a certain amount of upfront costs, and then your rate of return, as it were, uh, increases. So in other words, I need to uh, set up uh, microphones and a video camera and a half dozen computers to do this program. If I have only one subscriber, <laughs> then 100% of what my revenue goes towards uh, administrative stuff. But as, as soon as I get up to a certain point, that number begins to get smaller. And I guess that's part of the dilemma as well. Yeah, that's right. And, and also on the ads, I mean, like I said, it's easy to show a right. big chunk for an ad buy. But you know, but even within that ad buy, there, there's money that is not like ultimately traceable through to where it ends up. It's not all going to the TV station uh, for the airtime. Right. Some of it is going to commission uh, for the ad buy, you know, to the ad buyer, into the ad buyer's pocket. And then even after that, because these ad buys, like you said, are placed up front, there are often refunds for unplaced airtime. And then that is goes into a complete black hole. I mean, sometimes on the, on the, uh, the rare exceptions, you'll actually see a refunded payment from a TV station or from an ad buyer show up on an FEC report as a receipt, but that is so uncommon. More often than not, that refund money is sort of like the ultimate in dark money. It gets split up, split up between all the consultants who are involved in making the ad and placing the ad and the strategy behind where to air the ad. Uh, and so, you know, it, it's sort of easy, again, for Carl Rove or for others to point to that and say, look, we're spending all this money in service of the cause. It's more difficult to trace it through to its ultimate end result. Why do you think this is, I mean, uh, you know, obviously some of this happens on the left, but I think um, it just does not seem to be as rampant. Why do you think that's the case? I think that, you know, the right is fragmented right now, and the right uh, is sort of at war with itself, and there are factions that are competing to sort of control the, sh the, the, uh, the, the course of the Republican Party and the conservative movement. And so this, this creates sort of ambiguity and uncertainty uh, that, 
you know, some of these folks aren't able to, to play upon it because there is no uh, sort of officially blessed. If you're a conservative who wants to support, you know, fiscal conservatism and uh, oppose uh, taxation, then this is the group that you give to. Uh, you know, there are six or seven, probably 60 or 70 groups that could, you know, say that that's in fact what they're doing. Uh, some of them are sort of less reputable than others. On the left, on the other hand, I think it's partly because uh, the, uh, you know, during this sort of period in which we've seen the growth of big money and the sort of uh, growth of, uh, of big uh, pl- of people who are trying to raise money in politics, the, the, the Democrats have had the White House and they have had sort of strong leadership, say what you will about Obama, you know, he and Harry Reid and Nancy Pelosi have done a good job of sort of keeping uh, the movement united. And there's, it's, to some extent, it's, it's made easier because there's less, um, you know, there, there's less competition. But, you know, the, the, these different factions of the movement as well, uh, you know, the environmental groups, uh, the abortion rights groups, there was sort of like a well-recognized and almost like unofficially endorsed uh, set of groups that are do that are active in this space, and if a new one were to arise, it would it would really raise eyebrows, and there would be a, a significant vetting, both hopefully by donors, but then also by the groups that are the recognized brands, uh, saying you know to determine whether this is a, a, a sort of valid uh, you know use of donor cash, and you don't have that on the right. So, so, so in other words, I mean, there obviously there's been groups out there, you know, um, that have. I don't know, um, uh, for Americans for tax freedom and for, I mean, there are, there are groups out there that could validate these, but um, we don't have our, on the left, we don't have our Benghazis that we can go and raise money off of for literally years, it seems like, or uh, Lois Lerner. Uh, I mean, I, I, I think, does it have anything to do also with just how much cash is out there just how much of a business it is. I mean, it it occurs to me, and and the, and the irony here is too, is that all right, McCutcheon, um, his packs may be, uh, you know, scams as it were. I mean, from my perspective, obviously, I'm a little bit biased, but I think a lot of this is scams. Um, but it seems to me that uh, McCutcheon's packs, aside from financing this massive Supreme Court hey, Tim, case. I think I lost you there. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, lastly, and then and then we'll wrap it up here. It's um, do you, do you think to a certain extent it's just a function of there's a just a tremendous amount of of money out there and uh, that on some level there's really no way to defeat this uh, I guess rise of scam politics in some way. Yeah, I mean that's certainly the case. It would have to be sort of internal self policing. Uh, and that is, is what I was suggesting that the left has done a good job of, and the right has done less of a good job of. And part of the reason is that there is such um, suspicion and, and maybe enmity in the, in the conservative base for the Republican establishment. They feel like they've been sold out uh, by Mitch McConnell and John Boehner, uh, you know, uh, re- reaching agreement with Democrats to uh, raise the debt ceiling and increase spending and not taking a hard enough line on on taxation and other sort of hot uh, button issues that really animate conservative giving, and so that even when Mitch McConnell and John Boehner come out and say this is a scam pack, people say, huh, "Who are you to tell me what's a scam pack? I think that you're a scam." Uh, so until there's, I think, a little more uh, of sort of a, a, a powerful and uh, respected consensus Republican leadership, I think it, the, the the ground will remain fertile for this type of scam pack. Ken Vogel of Politico, author of Big Money on the Trail of the Ultra-Rich Hijacking America's Politics. Thanks so much for your time today. Hey, it was a pleasure, Sam. 